Welcome to this webinar, seminar about what to expect at summer school in 2025. Um, it's designed so that all those questions that you have about what to expect about the courses and classes and topics and the people and what it feels like are answered. So you can sort of make a few decisions about whether it's for you or if you have decided to attend, which um, stream you're going to attend. Okay, so first off, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming from today from the land of the Ghana people and pay my respects to elders past and present and anybody with Indigenous heritage on the call. Sovereignty was never ceded. If you'd like to put where you're coming from today, please do feel free. So as an ARDC event, um, we have our code of conduct and we expect people to behave in a respectful way to each other. Um, we haven't an, uh, enabled closed captions, but we are recording this just so people know. Um, if you'd like to turn on your video so you can see each other, please feel free. Um, and if you've got questions during the session, please post in the Zoom chat and at the end we'll sort of collate them. So again, some of this material, um, some of the material that's going to be shared is copyright, so please don't unshare it. And we're starting with poll. The poll, the question is, have you registered for summer school? So can people please um, either answer or use that QR code to indicate? And I'm going to see if I can find the poll so I can see what's happening. Okay. So we've got 37% have registered, 33% uh, intend to register, and 30% haven't registered. So we've got about 30, 30, 30, which is kind of nice. We're getting more registrants now. I will leave that running, and as people join, we'll see more. But that's just interesting to, to sort of get an idea of um, who's here in the room. Okay, so... Today, what we're going to do is talk about what summer school is. We're going to talk to Liam, who's a previous attendee, about what it was like to come to summer school last year. I'm going to talk a bit about what's happening in 2025, because there's lots and lots of different things happening uh, in the sessions. And then uh, the people who are leading the workshop streams, and I'll talk more about what workshop streams are, We'll talk about what's happening. So they are here also. So at the end, when people have questions, you can actually ask of them exactly, well, will you be covering this or that? Okay. So summer school. At the HASS in Indigenous Research Data Commons, we create research infrastructure that um, allows people with very small pro research projects to share, to do things that they couldn't do on their own so that we can enable a um, research intensive future for Australia. So one of the things that we want to do is we've um, noticed that um, people need particular skills in order to um, access our um, infrastructure. Um, we're also part of what our different projects that we do do is to mentor an upcoming a um, lot of researchers. And so there's a lot of um, things that the summer school is aiming to do. We're aiming for researchers, higher degree researchers, so PhD students, early career researchers in the humanities, arts and social sciences, plus Indigenous data custodians, um, so people who have Indigenous data, who, people who are Indigenous and custodians of data. So that's the people that we're aiming at for summer school. We're holding it in Brisbane from the 4th to the 6th of February next year at the University of Queensland campus. And we're actually really, really lucky. We've got the Abel Smith Building. And we've got the Gordon Greenwoods buildings, which are really, really close. And we've got this little spaceship um, summer school that we're all going to be very, very close together. So it's really, really nice. How to register. Um, I believe links are being flicked out as I speak about the registration. Um, so you just need to go on to Eventbrite to register. It's free for residents of Australia. Okay. So now Liam, is Liam in the house?
I suspect Liam is not in the house, so we're going to go to plan B. So this is sort of something we thought of maybe a minute ago, which is what's it like to attend summer school. Simon was there last year. So I guess <coughs> in, yep, in Brisbane this year, in um, Melbourne this year, earlier this year, summer school was held over three days at um, Monash University, Cur not Clayton. Caulfield. Caulfield. Thank you very much. Um, so over three days, we had workshops, we had case studies um, across the campus. Um, Simon, how many um, summer schools have you actually been to, apart from the last one? I was at the first one as well in 2022. Cool. Okay. And yeah. in terms of atmosphere, if somebody isn't sure that they know enough to be at summer school, um, what was your sort of feeling about that? I think that there's no reason for anybody to feel worried that they don't know enough to come to the summer school. Uh, a lot of the material starts from the assumption that people don't have a deep background. A lot of it is tailored for people who are starting out because we know that we're covering topics that a lot of people may never really have thought about. And also, I would say my experience is that the there's fantastic peer relationships that go on and that people who maybe don't know so much about one topic interact with people who do know about that topic and it benefits everybody that way. You, could, you, know, you, you share knowledge, you find people who can maybe help you along and there's no reason to be scared of not having knowledge to begin with. Yeah, I, I think what I've observed is sometimes people might not know what an application programming interface is, an API, for example, but they've got all this disciplinary knowledge that once they know that, they think, well, that could happen and that could happen and that could happen. And so somebody who's got that technical knowledge is suddenly talking to somebody who's got this research use and I think that the technical skills, part of it is actually that seeding and that conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the overall aim, I guess, that I see for the summer school is to, to broaden people's tool sets, to broaden the research culture that people are being trained in. And absolutely, disciplinary knowledge is part of that. And we know that people bring that. But there's also a whole sort of methodological knowledge and technological knowledge which people are going to have different levels of comfort with and will help you to get across what you need that can help your research. Yeah, and, and in terms of food, did people go hungry? Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, there was plenty of food. Um, and aside from food, the actual the, the space where we had refreshments turned into you know a fabulous hub for everybody. The noise level in that room was um, unbelievable on some food breaks. I was almost had to run away to get quiet sometimes, but it was really exciting. The buzz. Yeah, and we've just we've deliberately designed that so we've got the um, foyer is going to be where people have food, but we're going to have sort of stuff up on the walls, and that's a space. But also we've got some classrooms that people can go to. So yeah, part of what we're doing, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, is that deliberate downtime all those connections to happen. Um, is there anything else you'd say to somebody who's sort of thinking about whether summer school is for them or not for them? I would say um, if you even got to the stage of considering going, you should be coming. You already got some kind of interest, and I'm sure when you get there, you'll find lots of stuff that will interest you. Cool. And you don't have to go to everything. That's the other thing. If there's a lot of stuff there that looks like, oh, gosh, this is too overwhelming, you can take downtime and just talk to that nice person about their skirt, which is a conversation I had. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I might move on a bit to talking about some of the things that people are going to be doing, and then we'll go on to those people who are leading workshops, talking about what's going to be um, happening in those workshops. So, okay, this year, this year and incidentally this is a picture from um last year that's uncle michael williams at the front who's talking to to the class um so the way that i sort of want to do it is 
I want to make sure everybody's learning to each, from each other. So everybody, there's so much enthusiasm, experience and knowledge in the room. So the idea is we meet, we chat, we share, we learn, we inspire, we challenge and mentor and then go away and make and do. So what I'm trying to do is I don't want people to think of summer school like once upon a time when you were at uni, where you were in the lecture theatre and you were just looking at somebody or at school when you had your hand up in town and it was just very linear. This is designed to make the connections between people happen and we're, we've got quite a bit of space for that to happen. So on the first day, we're starting off gently with a number of 101 sessions. There's three reasons for that. One is last year, people said they really felt like there were a lot of terms and concepts that were being shared. And they really felt like they needed just that introduction to get over it. So part of that is for those people who aren't sure of particular terms and concepts, that's there. The other reason is we want this to be a conversation. I talked earlier about, you know, I don't know much about APIs, but gee, I've got this disciplinary knowledge, is we're wanting, even if you are going to the Indigenous Data Governance uh, Workshop, for you to be able to have a conversation with somebody about administrative data. So what we're encouraging is if you've enrolled for one of the workshops roughly about those topics, go to the other 101s so you understand the concepts and the vocabulary that other people are be using so you can join in in those conversations. The third reason for the 101s is some people are quite daunted about the workshop that they've enrolled in. So although the workshops will start very low and go up, some people might think, look, I really, really want to know about Indigenous data governance from a 101, a basic conceptual vocabulary level, before I feel confident to tackle the workshop. So they're the reasons. One is people said we want basic introductions so that you can be part of the conversation. Go to one that isn't the one that you've enrolled in, or if you're feeling really, really unsure, there is something that can give you grounding. Okay. On day two, we've got three case studies. People said last year that they wanted to see a lot of this stuff applied. So we actually have that um, in three case studies, which are going to be recorded, and there'll be a chance to um, talk to people. A lot of what we're wanting to do is, yes, people are giving sessions, but we're also encouraging people to be there for the whole three days. So if you see somebody talking about the time-layered cultural map, and you don't know what that is, or you've got questions, you can actually find them afterwards and talk to them. Right in the middle of the event, we're going to have a data solutions exchange. The idea is that some people have some really cool, cool data tricks that they might have known for three years or they might be wanting to share. It might be that in the workshop so far, there's been a problem that people have had that said, they've said, oh, look, I want to have that solved. It might be that people have problems with some research that they're doing and they've got a data problem. So the idea is that we cluster and group around these particular problems and solutions and people can have a bird of a feather and be mentored through those solutions. But also part of that can form an idea of what we cover in the workshops afterwards or, or that can be brought in as we go. The explore and expand sessions. Last year, people said that um, it was a long day and it was. So this year, we're running the formal proceedings on day one from 10 to four, day two, 10 to four, and then we're all going home at 2.30 on the last day. And that's deliberate because people are gonna be working and thinking and engaging hard. So we actually don't want people to sort of get to the end of the day and be floppy. However, we know that it's going to be exciting, interesting. People are going to meet people who have a lot to offer and share. Stuff's going to come up in the workshop where the workshop pre presenter needs to say, look, we're not really covering that now. And what we've done is these explore and expand sessions, which are four to five on the first day, nine to 10 on the second, four to five on the second, and nine to 10 on the third. We have the classrooms open. We have all the material there. So we've got the internet, we've got... Um, projectors, we've got the people. So the idea is that we can run ad hoc sessions. So if within a workshop, we find that we need an extra two hours on the workshop because it's taking longer, or it's getting really interesting, we can spill out into those sessions if the class would like to. If people have something 
that they hadn't thought about, but now they're really excited to talk about. If people have something that is relevant to Hass and Indigenous research that they'd like to be talking about, then that's a time when they can actually share um, that way. So the idea is that this is participant driven, but um, if people would like some mentorship about particular topics, that's a good place to also re um, request that. And the workshops. Okay, the workshops run across day one in the afternoon, day two in the afternoon, and then all day in day three. Okay, the idea is for each of them, our first session we've called onboarding and then it's some other stuff. So in that first session, we'll find out who's in the room and what they're interested in. We'll share with people where you can find the learning material. We'll make sure people understand how this workshop and the next three workshops fit together and what's going to happen across the workshops. We'll identify the learners who are a bit sort of, mm, I'm not sure about this, and the learners who are extremely confident and can actually be mentors. And we'll make sure that if you need to install anything on your computer, it's been jolly well done. So that's at the end of the first day before we have the final plenary. And we're doing it that way because if you discover that you don't have what you need installed or you're just wanting to um, understand more, a bit more about the basics, you've got another day before the next workshop to get all that stuff sorted. We're doing that like, that way because those next three workshops are going to be, we're going, we're hitting the ground, we're just doing because everybody knows exactly what they're doing, okay? The three streams are Indigenous data governance, organising has and Indigenous data, computational techniques for obtaining and analysing has and Indigenous data, and administrative data analysis in R, an introduction to those. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to the people who are running those streams to talk about what they are um, to expect. I'm going to start with Sam because when you look at the background of Sam, you will see that Sam is in an airport. So over to Sam about Stream C. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome from Brisbane Airport. Um, hopefully there's no issues with the sound. So Stream C covers computational techniques for obtaining and analyzing data. Um, obviously, there are a lot of computational techniques and methods out there. There's a broad variety of techniques. Um, there's too much for us to cover even, in, even if we took a few weeks. So the strategy we took for putting this together was to give you a sampling of different methods and approaches that can be used for, that are useful in a lot of different disciplines or adaptable to a lot of different disciplines, even if the things we're talking about may not look quite like where you'd want to start for your own work, we think they'll give you a lot of food for thought in a lot of places, uh, a lot of starting points for new and exciting research. Um, so the four specific uh, streams we're going to cover. So the first stream I'll be taking, which is onboarding and using Jupyter Notebooks. So we're going to use that to introduce you to some basic uh, programming with Python to interact and collect some data from the web using an API. Now, we did, this is where we have the 101 sessions because I just said a lot of keywords. And it's okay if you don't know what any of that means, we're going to be stepping you through and starting from scratch. The second thing will be run by Dan Angus from uh, QUT, looking at data donation methods and tools for online platforms and social data. So that's how can we study online platforms? How can we study social media? How can we collect social media data for your research? The third stream I'll be taking again, which is looking at how we can use computational methods for text data. So that is, how can we work with data sets larger than we'd be able to read in a lifetime and start to do something useful and meaningful in our own research? And then the fourth will also be taken by Robert Fleet from QUT Digital Observatory, who will be looking at how we can do network visualizations of social media data. So that's how you one common and powerful tool for social media analysis. So those four together give you a really broad sample of different starting points for your research. And we hope that they give you a, uh, at least one or two good ideas to take away and start working on for your own work. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, Sam. And I just should mention that Sam is from the Language Data Commons of Australia and he's at UQ, so I didn't do that. Okay, so now we're going back to stream A. And is Levi in the house? I know he's been unwell, so. Okay. I am going to go through um, the information that we've got there. Excuse me, because I'm going to be reading it. If you go on to um, either our ARDC webpage about the um, summer school or to the um, Eventbrite, you will see links out about each workshop to our participant information sheets. And I am just flipping over to the participant information sheets to talk about um, what that is um, going to involve. So the onboarding is talking about fair and care and Levi has asked that people actually make sure that they have read the um, originating arc article around care. So what you need to do in order to make data that's culturally respectful as well as able to be findable, shareable. Um, that's going to be um, talking about... Um, how that relates to governance of Indigenous data ready for the next workshops. The next workshop, which um, Levi will be doing with Nick Carr from Karajong uh, AI, will be talking about metadata. And so what it's going to do is it's going to look at, okay, I've got something, some information that does have an Indigenous context. What's the best way to label, divide that information up, and describe this information that I've got. So what it will be doing is it will be doing some of the, um, uh, it'll have a worksheet and people will be do using either, you'll need either Google Sheets or Excel for that. And people will be working their way through adding some metadata, what it looks like, puzzles that you have when you're trying to describe Indigenous data. Workshop number three, is going to be looking at, um, I'm just having a look. That's looking, okay, that's starting with the Indigenous Data Network's metadata entry tool. This is a tool that's been developed by the Indigenous Data Network. It's a, um, you go online, um, I don't have a link to it in our, um, our, um, our run sheet, so sorry about that. Um, but basically what it does is it takes you through some of the questions that you would ask bit by bit. It um, says things like, hey, have you thought about the type of license you're going to apply to this data? It gives you, offers you the different types of licenses that you might want to need. It talks about um, the idea of an agent. Okay, here's somebody who's a entity, a organization or a person. What does that mean in an Indigenous context and being respectful? So it's taking people through that tool. The very last workshop, the fourth workshop, this is going to be actually hands-on using the Indigenous Data uh, Network catalogue. So it's going to be doing some entries, creating. So now you've learned about metadata, you know how to divide your um, data. You've had a look at the metadata tool, so you know technically when you're creating records what you need to do and that creates a nice little record that then can be read into the Indigenous Data Network catalogue. What's the Indigenous Data Network catalogue? You'll need to be in Stream A. I can explain more. Please, if you want to find out more, do go to our ARDC um, website. It does have an explanation, but it will be quite well explained during A4. Okay, I'm going to move on to... Simon for Stream B. Simon is from LDARCA, Language Data Commons of Australia, and from UQ. Over to you, Simon. Would I share my screen, please? You may. Let me stop sharing mine. Over to okay. you. Uh, yeah, let's get that into the slideshow. Having just listened to Kit talk you through Stream A, I'm aware that actually there's quite a lot of overlap, but we're taking different perspectives on some of the same questions. So Stream B is called Organising Us and Indigenous Data. 
And the reason that we think that this is important information is because of the difficulty and the importance of collecting data to begin with. Many of you are probably collecting data for your own projects, and you know how difficult it is. You know how much time it can take and even how much money it can take if you're lucky enough to have any money to spend on it. Given that you know, you're devoting a lot of time and effort producing this material, you must believe that it's worthwhile, and that implies that you believe it's worth keeping it into the future and making it possible for other people to benefit from it as well. So the R in FAIR is for reusable, and reusable data is very crucial. And that's one of the things that we really want to focus on in this stream. How do we make data sustainable so that it can be reused in useful ways in the future? Now, I've just talked about people using your data, other people using your data in the future, but actually it's also worth thinking about it just from your point of view. And this is a great little message from the social media platform that shall not be named from a couple of years back. Someone saying, you know, it's really important just for you in the future to have data that's sustainable because you won't remember stuff about what you did. But if you've worked to make it useful into the future, then that can benefit you as well as other people. So that's that's the point of view that we're coming from in this stream. The things that we're going to cover are, first of all, some basic concepts of data management and the idea of sustainability that I've just been talking about. And that will be you know, starting right from the beginning. What do we mean when we're talking about these concepts? Closely allied to what it talked about with the stream A, we'll be talking about the importance of really good metadata. The better the description you can attach to the data, the more useful it's going to be to people in the future. However, uh, and also it mentioned um, licensing, access conditions. We'll be going into that in some detail as well, because that's also really important. You need to set out explicitly who's going to be able to do what kinds of things with which bits of material in the future. Otherwise, problems could arise. So we're going to look at these issues, but as any of you who may have had to deal with it might know, creating good metadata is actually pretty tedious. It's a time another time-consuming job, and it's not much fun. So we're going to talk at the end, towards the end of the stream in the last couple of workshops, particularly in the last one, we're going to be looking at a way of putting your data and metadata together that makes them really useful, which is using a packaging standard called RO Crates, which stands for Research Object Crates. And we'll be introducing you in a hands-on exercise to using a tool for editing, creating metadata, and packaging things together as an RO crate. So you will actually get to work with your own data, and you'll walk away with a genuine RO crate, which you could share with other people. And that's what we hope we'll get you to do in Stream C. Thank you very much, Simon. Let me just share my screen again. Hello, share. Okay, so I actually had a quick look at who was in the room and I could see that Matthew was in the room, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, Matthew Curry is a social science, from the Social Science Research Infrastructure Net Network and he is at the University of Queensland and he is going to talk to us about Stream D. Over to you, Matthew. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Kit. Um, yeah, so um, I will, along with um, a, a colleague from um, from UQ here, uh, be our stream is kind of focused on administrative data analysis uh, using R. So it's going to be like a really basic level introduction, and the idea is um, to introduce government administrative data. So if you don't know what that is, quickly, it's like data that's collected about individuals in this case. Um, for purposes other than research, which has then kind of been repurposed for our use um, as, as social science researchers. So the, <clears throat> the asset that we'll kind of be talking about um, contains 
Commonwealth government records. So like anytime you interact with Medicare or you interact with the ATO, so your tax return data, um, higher education data, all that sort of stuff gets um, sucked up by the government and some of it or most of it gets um, can be packaged and used for research. So we'll kind of introduce what there is in Australia and how you might use it and what you can learn from it. Um, and then we'll use R, which is an R Studio, which is a free software program for um, quantitative analysis. Um, and we'll we'll have you load in um, data that we make up that kind of looks like the real thing, but we, which we can't use because of um, privacy concerns for this class. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of give you something in the same format. Um, and we'll introduce some of the basics using live coding sessions. So um, the kind of second day, we'll be doing basic data manipulation stuff. So how do you explore the data? How do you modify and create new variables? Um, and then we'll kind of build on that in the third session, um, further manipulating data. So we will like subset data. So we'll take um, specific observations that we're interested in, or we'll take specific variables we're interested in so we don't have to do everything on the whole data set. Um, we'll also join multiple data sets together. So these are all of the things that you need to understand and need to know how to do before you can actually get into the proper analysis. Um, and of course, it takes up most of your time. Um, and then in the final session, we will kind of use everything we've learned um, and we'll use our um, synthetic data set that we have been working on and manipulating this in the previous three sessions. Um, and we'll end up doing um, some progression analyses in R. So again, we'll kind of, if people aren't familiar with this, we'll, we'll walk you through um, everything and we'll kind of basically create a research question. We'll answer that research question with the, the kind of tools that we have and we'll end up creating um, or, or kind of going over some um, I guess pointers on on useful tips for interpreting results um, with the help of some graphs and tables, which we will also create um, in R together. So yeah. Thank you very, very much, Matthew. And I know that people probably have questions, but we'll leave them to the end um, for this. Um, if people are wondering how we got these topics, um, there's what we've done for the last three years and what's been received well. There's feedback that people gave um, in the last summer school. About June, July this year, we actually had a big online workshop where we said, what should we be covering at summer school? And lots of people made a lot of, we just had, I think the number of categories, I think I had probably a hundred different categories from that in terms of the data. And then we talked with our partners who were actually going to do the delivery about what um, they had capacity to do and what they thought was important. So one of the things we're really interested in is whether we've actually got the right um, type of topics for um, people. We will very happily take for next year suggestions about different ways but I'm actually really really pleased with what we've got they really dovetail nicely and what I really like is we'll have a lot of really cool conversations as a result of people doing quite different things but as um, Simon said you know there's that overlap stream A and stream um, B probably have the most obvious overlap where they're doing similar stuff but quite quite um, from different coming from different points of view and actually if people are talking about what they've seen in each workshop, it just becomes richer and everybody learns from each other. Okay, so if you're still not sure whee, about um, what you'd like to do and what stream you'd like to register into, one thing to know is because of the way we structured it, where you know you've got your onboarding and then your um, everything for the next three workshops, people actually who are teaching people who are in the workshop have confidence that you know whatever was in the onboarding workshop and you've done that. So we don't need to re-explain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important to know that these are simultaneous workshops. You can only go to one, but we're making sure there's lots of opportunities to discuss what's going on with each other. So if you have actually, we ask you as you register, which stream are you registering into? If you decide that um, you'd like to go to a different stream, just email contact at ardc.edu.au and we'll arrange for you to be swapped into another stream. Um, so it is sort of final, but if you're thinking now, 
you know, I, I really think I'd like to be in the other one. We've also got to help you decide. We've got the Choose Your Summer School Pathway, which talks about, you know, this is what's going to be covered. But it's also a nice way to actually see what the conversation is if you're not quite sure whether summer school is for you or not. We've also got, and the example I've got on the screen is for um, the second workshop in Stream B, these participant information sheets where it tells you exactly what prep you need, who's doing it, why you need to learn it, what's going to be covered, and you can see how the different workshops in your stream relate to each other. So please um, do have a look at the timetable and the agenda for the summer school. Please have a look at these participant information sheets. And then if you've got questions about a lot of it, we've got the contact um, uh, address, but um, I'm also happy once um, that's gone through there to actually answer some of those questions. So there's another couple of things I want to talk about, and then we're going to open the floor to whatever you would like to ask. And incidentally, I haven't been looking at the questions in chat because I don't have enough brains to do that. So I do apologize. So I'll, I'll need some help with that. Okay. The other thing to know is that we're offering 10 $1,000 travel bursaries for people to attend summer school. This is people who um, are Hassan Indigenous researchers and or custodians of Indigenous data. Um, you need to live outside the um, greater Brisbane area because we're holding it in Brisbane and we move the summer school around to different capital cities each year. Um, so there's details about that on the ARDC web page and in the Eventbrite registration. We also have travel bursaries to the other event that we're running um, the day before summer school, some smaller travel bursaries, which is the Indigenous Data Governance Masterclass. Now, this is a day at the State Library of Queensland for all researchers, not just has Indigenous researchers. It's for Indigenous data custodians. And we're going to be looking at the, um, you know, the State Library of Queensland's collections. We're going to be looking at the type of data that some Indigenous data custodians have. We're going to be looking at, okay, so what is Indigenous data and data governance and why has it um, arisen and why is it important? And at the end, we're looking at how you apply a tool that's just about to be released called the Indigenous Data Governance Matrix to your Indigenous uh, data. So in, Indigenous Data Governance stream for summer school is quite technical. You're seeing how to do hands-on, you're seeing how to use a lot of tools, you're getting a really a quite techie background. For the Indigenous Data Governance Masterclass, it's much more discussions of the why, seeing the wide range of Indigenous data that is there, if that makes sense. Okay, so now over to you. Um, I know that Mary's probably been monitoring the questions in the um, chat, so I might turn to Mary to sort of point us out to some key questions, and then maybe the people who have asked them can talk if they would like to. I haven't actually, I don't think I've seen any kids. I think we're okay, okay, cool. And I will stop sharing my screen. So in that case, I will turn it over to um, whether people do have any questions. Feel free to put up your hand using the put up your hand um, option in Zoom. Or if nobody sort of starts talking, you can just start talking. It sounds to me like we actually have covered most of what people would like. Um, question, is the summer school appro appropriate for public health researchers? Uh, it is aimed at HASS and Indigenous um, uh, uh, researchers and people who are custodians of Indigenous data. And if your public health um, has um, a component of Indigenous data, then yes. But do know that a lot of the conversation is going to be sort of with the um, qualitative kind of um, uh, point of view. It's going to be taking the um, disciplinary conversations across linguistics, across... Um, the GLAM sector across um, social sciences. So it actually is a really wide conversation. But um, yes-ish, 
if um, you are interested in what you do with your Indigenous data, if you're expected to get um, techniques to how to handle your public uh, health data, for example, using Jupiter, yes, you could pick up some skills from that, but it won't be focused and you, your people won't be there, if that makes sense. Um, there's a question in regards to the travel bursary conditions. What's your definition of being employed at an academic level? Are GLAM sector collection managers considered academic? We manage data rather than applying it to research. How um, the ARDC has particular audiences that we aim for, and that is researchers and that is Indigenous data custodians, which means although um, you're extremely welcome to attend, um, I would say put in your application anyhow. Um, but it is very likely that because the people that we are funded in order to, to support our researchers, if there's a lot of researchers who have as good a case as you, they would that would tip them over. But do feel free to apply if you would like to. Um, Kit. Mary's saying the master class. Yes, sorry, Matthew. Sorry, Kit. I just wanted to, um, sorry if I'm interrupting, but um, addressing mm -hmm. like the, the first question, the public health. Like, I think, like you, you kind of mentioned this already that methodologically there'll be something to learn, like in the administrative data session, for example, we're not going to use any of the health data that exists there. But if that's something that interests you, if you want to analyze Medicare data, pharmaceutical data, which does exist in the same environment that we will be kind of replicating, although we'll focus on education and labor market stuff, like that might be one way to do it. And I'm sure the other streams as well will have like methodological things that are widely applicable to, to public health and other disciplines. Absolutely. We're, we're not actually publicizing it sort of wider than Hassan, just because we think it's so fantastic. We want to make sure that you know people are, are, are coming who are sort of fitting in the window. But you know, this is this is really wide stuff. Um, so that's kind of why we're not um promoting it to things like public health, although there might be some things that if you're in public health, you could um, pick up. How different is Stream A to the masterclass? Okay, so Stream A is much more hands-on, much more looking at um, if you've got Indigenous data, how would you like to divide it up? What's appropriate terms to use? If you were trying to create a tool that um, computationally could share information appropriately as linked open data, what could you use to create that? Um, how does that fit into the Indigenous Data Network catalogue? Um, so it's going to have a lot of conceptual understanding. <laughs> you know, you, you're going to pick that up because every time you discuss what type of licence and who should we ask about um, the rights to reuse, you're having a philosophical conceptual discussion that could go on for the entire masterclass, the entire summer school. However, the masterclass is. Um, much more aimed at what data is there, what information is there, aimed at all researchers to look at, okay, what is Indigenous data governance generally? Why does it exist? Where might it be applied? And then at the end, it's looking at applying a particular tool to Indigenous data. Um, but it's a have you thought about this kind of tool? not a let's make a something that's code kind of tool, if that makes sense. Um, so does that answer? Or I'm, I'm happy to try and explain more about the difference between those two. Um, I'm not currently in research, but I intend to be in the near future. Will the summer school still be beneficial for me as an introduction or best to wait until I have more experience? <sighs> We would prefer people to actually be researchers or custodians of Indigenous data. Um, so, yes, you could possibly get some, something out of it, but um, this won't be, as far as I know, our last summer school. So you might be better off waiting until you can be part of the discussions that people are having about what's it like to be a researcher, what's it like to be an Indigenous data custodian. Um, basically anyone who turned up, you know, who had any experience could enrich or learn from what we're going to do. So I don't want to say, oh, it's not relevant, but I would, I would advise um, when you're studying and can bring stuff back to your institution, sort of apply it, that might be better. Um, 
I wonder if any of the sessions will be recorded and available later and if any of the resources, including PowerPoints, will be available later. For example, if it isn't possible to attend, will there be access to these resources subsequently? That's a really good question. And I've been discussing some of that with people uh, in the last week and some of it we decided early on. Because it's about conversations and it's about stuff going backward and forward, we've decided that the 101 sessions, every one of those is going to be recorded. Those basic conceptual vocabulary uh, introductions, they are all going to be recorded and shared. On day two, the case studies talking about how they're applied, we're going to have written versions of them put on our website. We're going to have recordings of those, again, put on our website. All the rest isn't going to be recorded to allow that free flow of conversation. The slides, we had a thought, think about that. A lot of people don't use slides as handouts. They use handouts as handouts. Um, and what we thought we would do, and this is a surprise to the speakers because it was in the context of what are we going to tell speakers about their slides, is we thought that we'd make that a um, negotiation with the speakers themselves. Um, and if they want to put their slides up, we will have a place for them. But we're not going to insist that people have their slides up or share their slides because some of it, last year we had people who had confidential data that they really couldn't share. Some people just prefer not to share in that way because some of these workshops are going to be sort of not necessarily following the slides. So, yes, we've tried to make sure that there are some really clear these are going to be recorded and we'll be putting them up and the rest of it probably not going to be recorded although we will be um writing an article about it to sort of talk about some of the key things and conversations that happened um and if when i answer these i don't fully answer what you'd like to hear please do come back to me but I'm going to go on to the next one. Would you recommend that registrants of Stream A also attend the Indigenous Data Governance Masterclass? Not necessarily. Um, uh, it depends what you would like to get out of both. It's certainly not necessary in order to um, attend, to understand Stream A, to have gone to the Indigenous Data Governance Masterclass. Frankie, I saw you unmuted. Did you have more you wanted to ask? Mistake. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Um, can you give an example of what tools would be used in Stream C? I work in data science and dipping into data governance a bit. I'm torn between A and C. I wonder if A would give me more to take home. I'm going to talk to Sam because I know he was deciding what tools he was going to be using. Is he still here or has he gone and caught his plane? His flight got pulled. Okay. I, I know that when I talked to Sam last, he was still trying to decide exactly which tools and which data he'd be using for um, A and uh, one and three in his um, stream. Um, in B, we're going to look at the Australian uh, Internet Observatory uh, talking about some of their tools that they use for data donation, which is a web browser um, uh, tool and there's also an app. I don't know how far they'll get into that in an hour. I know that in the um, last workshop for Stream C, they're talking about network analysis using some Reddit data um, around comments. Again, that's using Python and J Jupyter notebooks. Um, the yeah, I I hope that gives you enough. But yes, I know that Sam is still trying to work out what are going to be the best um, tools for that third workshop in Stream C. Does that give you enough information or did you want to know more, Jean? Okay. Um, Sam, I can see a comment, which is great. Thank you. Does the same apply to the master for the masterclass? I'm sorry. I can't remember what the original question that matches to is. Mary? Oh, the question was, I'm not currently in research, but I intend to be okay. in the future. Um... Look, the masterclass is aimed at all researchers and it's aimed at all Indigenous data custodians So, and at the GLAM sector. So I would say... It will give you food to thought if you, for thought. If you don't have um, a problem you're trying to nut out, you won't be able to anchor it into um, 
what you're trying to do. So it might be harder to digest, understand, use and reuse the information. We have 200 places. We've got um, twice the many places as for the summer school. So, yeah, I would say that would be probably a more appropriate um, one to go to. Um, Donnie, I'm currently collecting data film on country with Indigenous participants. Are there any sessions that touch on Indigenous data sovereignty or are they embedded in the stream sessions? Uh, it will be throughout the entire, it will permeate the entire summer school, I can tell you if it's anything like last year. Um, but definitely um, it will be in the streams. I know that um, also in stream B, that what Simon's doing, you'll be very, very aware of Indigenous data sovereignty and you'll be talking about you know, the care principles and why um, some of the decisions around metadata should be made in the way that they are. Every um, stream is going to bring it in in some way. The other thing is that um, because we're trying to learn about the people who are in the room from the very start, one of the icebreaker things we're trying to do is actually say, okay, who's in the room? What do you research? What do you want to learn? We can sort of skew it towards what people want to know within reason. So if you um, are saying, I want to know about Indigenous data sovereignty or I want to share a lot about Indigenous sovereignty and about the problems that I'm having, particularly with my non-text media, then it may well be that one of those explore and expand sessions we can actually do um, with your particular data, your particular problem, and somebody who's got an interest and expertise in Indigenous data sovereignty, put them together and have them as one of those explore and expand sessions, or it's a bloody good lunchtime <laughs> session, so uh, discussion. So um, I'm without knowing exactly what Levi's covering, it will be rooted in Indigenous understandings of Indigenous data sovereignty, um, as Indigenous data governance is, but not a session specifically about Indigenous data sovereignty, if that makes sense. Is, is that what you were after? Cool. Yeah, it sounds like it was. Okay. I'm just really excited by all the questions that people have had. They're, they're, they're really good and they're very, very useful. And they're things that I thought people probably would be wanting to know. Are there other questions that people would like to ask before we go on to the, hey, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, very much for attending and your, your questions. Um, I just wanted to let people know that um, International Data Week, it's described by my Colleen Marion, colleague Marion, who I think is here, as the Olympics of data. Uh, it's an, an international event that um, ARDC are supporting, again, in Brisbane from the 13th to 16th of October next year. So it's sort of something we'd like to promote. And we've got some contacts here for you if you want to describe subscribe to um, ARD to connect. The um, links are going out in the chat. Um, and I think that was a lovely session. Thank you very much to the speakers who shared. Thank you very much to the people who were questioning. Thank you very much to the pit crew. Um, and I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Cheers.